Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us, as always, is our favorite first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey there, Josh. Good to see you. Thank you. And also with us is our trusty, dusty research extraordinaire, button pushing guy. I couldn't do it without him. Am I being sarcastic? You'll never know. Jason Rugg. Hey there. Hello. <laughs> And back with us for a second time, two weeks in a row, is the consulting producer, Emmy Award winning, Sandy Gordon. Welcome back, Sandy. Thanks so much. Glad to be back. So last week, um, we uh, I want to get a, do a quick film update, but just quickly, I want to remind people that Sandy is working on The Girl Who Wore Freedom as a consulting producer. Uh, her, she has a background working in films such as Rudy, The Hudsucker Proxy, television series such as Party of Five. She's uh, published books on filmmaking. And uh, right now she's in the Chicagoland area working for DePaul University, um, which I do have a question about that. So I'd like to ask about that. Um, film update, though, real quick. Christian last yeah. week mentioned five um new film festivals that said yes come on over and i'm assuming today we have an update on distribution yes um no i'm not ready to give you that quite yet um, come on <laughs> it's only been like a year <laughs> did you see on the end of end of season cliffhanger that you're waiting for <laughs> didn't you see on the sheet josh i said don't ask me about distribution okay no i i, I don't i don't you don't read my notes <laughs> Uh, no, when this uh, comes out, we're on the doorstep of uh, the Chandler Film Festival in Chandler, Arizona. So uh, people need to go get their tickets. They're $15 and they will be able to watch the uh, film for a whole week and even tell their friends about it. So that's the film update for this week. Let's dive back in. We only have about uh, 27 minutes before Sandy has to go. So uh, let's dive right in. You said you had a question about where she's working now. Well, yes, that'll be my second question. Okay. Christian said we could ask whatever we wanted to. Absolutely. So, okay, Sandy, you gave us a great, you know, backstory to Rudy. I I'd love to hear like a great backstory to the Hudsucker Hud proxy. proxy. Yeah. Um, well, so my job at the Hudsucker proxy was working in the locations department also. Most of my feature film was locations except for um, one David Duchovny movie that I am blanking on the name that Return was shot me. here. Sorry. Return oh, Return to me. me. Thank you so much. Mini Driver, Bonnie Hunt. Um, and that one, I was a production assistant production coordinator, which is a whole other job uh, to talk about. But um, anywho, Hudsucker Proxy shot in Chicago for a month. Uh, most of it was shot in a studio somewhere else, but all of the exteriors of like the stock exchange looking buildings and stuff was LaSalle Street downtown. And it was all night shoots. And um, so the parts that I was involved with were all the street related outside nighttime stuff for that building. And we did an indoor scene in the ballroom of the, um, of a hotel, the Blackstone Hotel on um, Balbo in Michigan. And um, I rode in the elevator with Paul Newman. Thank you very much. That was my <laughs> story. But, um, and, and then right after that elevator ride, the elevator broke down. So I just missed being locked in an elevator with Paul Newman <laughs> by about five minutes. <laughs> but, um, That's what's your, what's awesome. your question? All right. Well, we should be talking more, you know, girl for girl who wore freedom related stuff. So let's move on, shall we? Um, we? We wanted to learn more about what it means to be a top-notch line producer. Again, it's got the word producer, can mean a thousand different things. W what does it mean to be a line producer in the world of you know live action film shoots? Yeah, so line producer, I mean, just the, the name of it alone is the line producing, meaning the budget line items. So you're mostly concerned with the budget. And but, you know, when you're talking about the budget, you're talking about so many different facets of the production. So it's the crew, it's the equipment, it's the locations, it's the props, it's the wardrobe, and literally anything that costs money is coming out of that budget. And so as the line producer, 
you know, what you do might vary if it's a big feature film or a big blockbuster movie versus a smaller indie film, or if it's a corporate video, or if it's a small local commercial, there are different levels to what that budget is going to entail. So if you are on a bigger, big blockbuster movie, you might have other people helping you. You're not in it fully alone, um, managing each of those line items that each department is managing their own budget within the big budget. There are many times in my world where I have a smaller situation. And so I'm managing all of it myself. Um, but so basically, yeah, just managing when you're managing the budget, you're kind of also managing the time and the whole plan for the entire shoot. So on a big film, you have, you know, probably um, people helping you like a assistant director who's helping to plan out the timing and to keeping people on track during the day. But when you don't have the budget for your assistant director, then you as the producer will, uh, will be the person on set watching the timing, keeping it moving. Because anytime you're behind, it's going to cost you money in the end. So it's really kind of managing the plan. What is our plan to get this done most efficiently and for you know, not just for the money, but just efficiently for your schedule. And I just want to say, this was another area where, remember, we always say this podcast is how not to do a documentary. Well, um, we never had a line producer. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I was working with a couple of other producers from the beginning to try to set up our budget and work within it. But this has been a really tough um area for us because we did not have anybody with expertise to help from the beginning. And a line producer should be brought on in the very beginning. And I did know this. Um, I've always known this. But you have to have a special type of person. And they are not easy to find. And they cost a lot of money. So because it is a lot of time, they're coming in in the beginning, they're helping you fix the budgets, and they are running those. And not only are they managing the time, the money, uh, helping to manage the schedule, sometimes they're even writing the checks, and they are the ones that are depositing money. And they are a key, key you know, player. And I would say, you know, if you're a first time filmmaker listening to this, do not skip this part. Find a good line producer early on um, because they will help you in the end and they will go all the way. I could still use a line producer now. We're still yeah. having trouble raising money. We still have tons of bills to pay and there's no end in sight. So, yeah, uh, I would say that um, with the with the line producer, to your point, it takes a lot of work because you're starting from the very beginning of the plan to map out your entire movement forward. So you're talking about your, your pre-production through the production, through the post-production. There might be someone who oversees the editing in the end and is, you know, a production supervisor or a post producer, depends on the situation, but you're the one who has the who is figuring out what is this going to cost? And you can't really determine that until you know what it is you're shooting. You can't ballpark it, which everyone wants you to do, but it's really dangerous to ballpark because any little piece of information that's missing from the puzzle could make your budget go completely haywire. You know, someone can say to me, I want to shoot a, a three minute film. How much is it going to cost? And I say, well, it depends, you know, what are you trying to do? And well, I'm just going to tell a story. And in the end of the day, when they finally get to what the story is, it's like, well, I, I'm going to, it's on a yacht. It's in the middle of the ocean and a helicopter comes down and it drops money over the boat and the end. It's like, well, OK, now, if you had told me that I would have planned completely differently than my scenario of it's two people in a park sitting on a bench. You know, it's one thing to cover your day at the park with a couple of actors and like controlling the crowd versus I need to rent a yacht. I need to get a permit for a helicopter. I have to pay the helicopter. So, you know, your budgets can be at completely different extremes. And as a producer, I'm there to help the creative people to say, maybe there's a better way to accomplish what you're trying to show. Like, do you need to have a gun in the actual scene or can you infer that there's a gun? You hear the click. So you know someone has cocked the gun, 
but you don't have to actually see it, right? Like, I just know it's there. They've got their hand in their pocket. I can see something there. And, you know, I did a, a shoot for a commercial and they wanted to have um, babies because it's a thermometer and they want to show how the baby work, you know, the thermometer works on a baby. Well, you know, to have a baby, you have to really plan around the crying baby versus a happy baby and what's their sleep schedule. And then you're trying to fit that in around the other stuff you're trying to shoot. And now you wanted to have the baby in the bathtub but you also want to have the baby eating cereal. And there are laws about how long you can have a working baby on camera. So you have all these things you have to think about. So my suggestion was, how about you show the bathtub being filled? You hear a baby in the background, but you show the bathtub. You show the mom prepping the meal. You're, you might even show her spooning the food, but you're not showing it come into the baby's mouth. And then when you're showing them in bed at night, you just have a doll covered by a blanket. No one will know. Look, I just saved you like $20,000 because we didn't have to plan for having multiple babies all over the place. So that's part of your job as the line producer is to say, take the script, figure out what has to happen in the most efficient way to film it. Take all the park scenes and have them all be in a row and you shoot them all back to back rather than shooting in the order that you see it in the film. Um, maybe you find locations that are close to each other. So now you don't have to move your trucks and reset your lighting or reset all your staging. The extras can stay where they are but you now just shift to this scene that's one block away versus having to come back to this block three weeks from now and re-permit the street and do all of this. So you're working with the locations people, you're working with each department head on what their needs are, and you're trying to fulfill everybody's needs and keeping it within the budget and the time frame. So you bring that line producer on super early so that they can map out that plan with you know what that budget is, know what that plan is. And then when you execute it, you know what your costs are going to be. And you've got probably a little padding in there for when something inevitably goes wrong. But it, but you, you know, to bring on a line producer and ask them to do you a favor is really tough because as much as I want to help and I would absolutely help with the film if it's my friend and I want to help them with their success, I can't make a living if I'm working for a year for free. So you really are going to have to pay something to a line producer, even if you just pay them in the beginning to map it out, have the plan in place. Then maybe you take a break for a while till you really have raised all the money that you need. And then you come back to hiring them again. That might be something you could do. Yeah. And in the documentary world, that's a little bit more possible. Or even in Jason's world in animation, it's a lot more controlled than um, the narrative film or a series. And, you know, but even in the narrative film or even in the documentary films, it line producers are hugely important in helping you make decisions because as a producer, you want lobster dinner. And you can't get lobster dinner often. And so your line producer is going to have to ask you questions like, let's think outside the box. You know, can we get imitation lobster for your lobster dinner? Are you willing to compromise there? Because if you don't compromise there, then you can't have this really delicious, you know, baked potato that you also want. Uh, make your choice. And you know, that that is really helpful. I mean, in simple things like with actors, actors cost all different amounts of money depending on so many things. Sometimes they will negotiate their rates. Sometimes they won't. A line producer is there to help you find the right person for your budget. Um, so there's they're just really key in helping you make those decisions. And they definitely deserve to be paid because it's not something that you can do halfway. You really need to be able to have somebody focused on it, which brings me to a question of what kind of person do you, should you be looking for, you know, as a line producer, what are the qualities that they need to do their job well? Well, you know, we're obviously we're all different people in how we handle our job, but I would say most of us who do line producing, um, 
you know, I come from a unique background, right? I have a really diverse background. So I, I've worked at a post facility for several years and I've worked with animators and graphic designers. I've also worked on feature films and, and swept up the confetti at the Hudsucker proxy that we used as snow on the South Street. Um, there are things that I have seen in my career because I've moved around a lot that other line producers really haven't had that same experience that I have and vice versa. They may have had experiences I haven't. But so speaking for myself, you know, it's a person who's very type A, who is very organized and um, pays attention to details and who also kind of sees the bigger picture. And the reason I bring up my background is that when I personally do producing for projects, I can't help but think about the editor and what the editor needs because I have been so many times on the back end working with an editor who doesn't have everything they need because nobody thought of it early on in their production. That's like the biggest problem with every film ever shot is that people don't think enough about the editor when they're especially with independent films people just get into their shoot and then they worry about the edit later and it's just a disaster you can't fix everything in post so um you know for me at finding out the background of the person and kind of knowing where they're coming from have they were if you're doing a documentary you want someone who's worked in interview style before who knows what you need to accomplish when you're interviewing somebody in their living room it's different than if you're going to shoot with a cinematographer that's always worked on big features they wouldn't really know how to how to mic somebody in their living room and to handle that and their camera but a lot of people who work on documentaries they kind of multitask they do their own lighting they might mic it themselves like you know you get you get nimble and you're kind of a one-man band sometimes so you know a line producer who's got a lot of resources to pull from or who knows the area or kind of can wheel and deal for you when you're looking for equipment and and renting for stretches of time um, anyone can do those things but having the um, the person personality to be assertive and to be able to tell people no, and especially in the world of COVID, to be able to say to someone, put your mask on. Like you have to be able to say to Meryl Streep, sorry, but we're not shooting if you don't have your mask on. You know, you have to have some sort of, um, you know, you can't be shy. You have to be able to to tell people like this is what we need to do and to keep them on task and also you know to be managing all of those details and juggling a lot of plates yeah i mean the one thing that i've been so impressed with sandy is uh, she is very short in stature but huge in personality <laughs> so i don't know how tall are you exactly I'm five feet yes and but she's very confident in what she knows and in who she is and in doing her job well that she can tell a Meryl Streep to put on your mask uh, gently and kindly, but firmly. Uh, she also is one of the things that I love about her is that she herself is gluten free and really is conscious about uh, people of different, um, you know, what whatever it may be, diets, uh, races, um, you know, religions. And so she's very conscious of their holidays, their diet. And as a line producer, if you're conscientious and you're thinking about that, there may be people on here who have different allergies and they can't eat these foods. We need to be, we can't just order from McDonald's. We have to think through what we're going to feed these people and the most, you know, economical way to do that. There are going to be people on the set who may uh, be, you know, kosher, or maybe they want to celebrate a Jewish holiday. We need to plan around that or ask them. And those are all things that Sandy has dealt with before. And I've learned that from her, that you know, one of the other things that she always says is take care of your cameraman and your sound guy and all of the people that are like most crucial doing the hardest work on the principal stuff or even the editor because they work so hard and are so zoned in. They don't think about their own health. They don't think about that they need to drink water. They don't think about that they need to sit down or take a break. And so, uh, you know, a line producer's job, you know, can also be, hey, we need to budget in time for rest for yeah. these people. 
And one thing that I think I'm a, a, a little bit more of a unique in, in my style, and I know there are more people kind of coming around to being more eco-friendly on set. I'm a total eco nerd. And so early on, I was trying to find ways to not be as wasteful because we're in a really wasteful industry. And so I, I experimented with water bottles for each person instead of bringing in Evian bottles. I gave everyone their own reusable bottle and wrote their name on it as like a gift that they could take away. I myself learned some things through that. A camera guy can't carry this thing around everywhere they go when they're carrying all the gear. So I've come up with other workarounds for that. But to that same point, I really think about, um, I try to plan everything. I'm like a little bit overkill. I don't think most people do this. I plan every little minute of the day in my head and I try to map out like, is that enough time where that person can take a break for five minutes? Can I give some padding in there? And I think about, um, you know, just sort of the flow of the team and is everyone going to be able to manage at this pace and with these um, restrictions that are being put on them for whatever reason. So I think about their food. I think about the day of the week. Bathroom I mean, breaks. Yeah, bathroom breaks. Like I think about that stuff. Um, I had another thought on that that's escaping me. But I, I think that, you know, I try to be conscientious about everyone as humans um, and not just like at my beck and call to finish a task, but like really what can we do to be good humans? And oh, and my other point was, I talk to the craft service people who provide the snacks and the nourishment during the day. And I try to, even though I'm a chocoholic, I am trying to have less and less junk food on any of my sets because that's what people gravitate towards. They'll eat M&Ms all day, but it's not actually helping your body. And you're not going to be actually at the end of the day, having as much stamina if you were eating carrots and, and apples versus um, Snickers bars all day, although there's peanuts in there. But so I really try to think about, I won't ever let anyone serve turkey as a lunch meal because then you're tired an hour later from eating turkey. So, you know, I try to really think about, you know, should we be serving a heavy pasta meal or is there another thing we can do that will give people the energy to do their jobs for, for this long stretch of time? Probably you don't have to think that thoroughly, but that's kind of how I handle my shoes. You're, you're like a mom. I am like a mom. I'm a short <laughs> Jewish mother. And, uh, you know, so I, it's funny. There was one time where I, I brought matzah to the set because I'm Jewish and it was Passover. So I just thought I'm probably the only one who cares and I don't even really care, but I'm just going to put this out there. And it was funny because by the end of the day, I had three people ask me what brand of matzah it was. And they said that it was, the, they were like addicted to it and they were eating it the whole time and they were eating all my matzah. So I was like, well, now I don't have any to eat, but um, <laughs> they were, and I've had people thank me. Um, on several shoots for not having the junk food because they know that they gravitate towards it. But when you have no other option and you're hungry, you're going to eat the carrot sticks, you know? So it's now it's just a matter of figuring out how to not be um, unsanitary with how you share vegetables on a plate. And, it, you know, how I don't want to have individually wrapped things either because that's bad for the environment. So I'm sort of trying to figure out how you handle that. But I think most people will thank you in the end if you have healthier foods to snack on. Moral of the story. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as we're getting to the end here, you mentioned uh, telling uh, Meryl Streep to wear a mask. <laughs> what, what do you see the future of filmmaking uh, in terms of how COVID has changed things? Do you think it's going to be changed forever? Like what, what, what's your feeling right now? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking there'll be, there'll be things that change forever for sure. Um, definitely big productions like TV shows and big feature films, they will never really have visitors on the set anymore. They'll use this as an excuse to not let studio heads show up with their children to like go tour the Spider-Man set because nobody wanted that anyway. <laughs> so now it gives them an excuse to shut that down. Um, but talking to some of my friends who are producing on, on these shows that are in town, um, nobody wants any of this. They hate it all. Nobody wants to have to deal with masks and separating and even individually wrap foods. Like it's just terrible. So they're making do with it. But I think in the end, and it kind of speaks to what you were talking about on your um, previous podcast with Hunter is sort of 
the industry is shifting, right? And I, if you look back at the start of television and there were three stations and then there was a fourth station and then there was HBO and then there were cable channels and now there's streaming sites, like what's the next iteration of that? And I think it's just getting more and more segmented where different demographics, like you know who watches Bravo versus who watches the Smithsonian channel, different types of people. And now there's a channel or a network or a streaming site for different groups of people. And I think it's going to get even more fragmented because you'll now you'll have either platforms where people can upload their own documentary and hope to catch an audience there, or there'll be platforms for platforms. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to continue to segment, but I think it's just going to be even harder to find an audience. It'll be like ratings used to be 20 million people watched that episode of that TV show. And now you're lucky if you've got 2 million people watching your TV show. I think you're going to be lucky if you have 1 million people watching a TV show and there'll just be more content to choose from. But yeah. And, and I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about this before. We'll talk about it more again. The, the gross national pro or the GDP the gross domestic product in people's pockets is plummeting and people want free content. So everything's like a race to the bottom and, you know, the free is going to be out there for everyone and they will have to hope to leverage that into some sort of paid, you know, feature as you dive in. Uh, but one of the pain points is there's just too many things out there to choose from. And how do you solve that problem? Um, yeah, I wish I'm we could talk for another hour about it. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't get to talk to Jason at all about any of his questions. So <laughs> we'll have to come. Oh, no, it's fine. I, I, you've walked through a lot of the pieces of it that I really want to learn about. So I think it, it's just really fascinating. Like I heard a story not too long ago about. Uh, TV show where they had an evil twin sister show up and they had this whole plan for, you know, how she was going to be dressed and everything like that. And uh, they said, and then someone showed up and said, Hey, um, you, you, you have us changing her hair and that'll take half a day. So we can't do that. How do, how can we make her evil? And so they said, okay, we'll make her evil by putting glasses on. And so it's like, you know, at, right. and, and now I know who was the one who said, hey, we can't do that. Right, right. <laughs> I know how who that role look, was. Right. How can yeah. we find a better way to do that? For sure. That's exactly what happens. You have to pick apart every scene to figure out, is this the right thing? And don't think that does apply to animation, Jason, because oh, yeah. once you get into something, there's all sorts of costs involved in that as well. And series right. are even more complicated. Well, and with animation, you have this added bonus of anytime you make a change to something, it's not a simple fix. People go, oh, can you just make that tail wag on the dog? It's like, well, that actually takes like 16 hours. And then you have to like send it off to another computer where it has to render overnight. And like, so what you need to do is to really map out in the beginning. And then if someone, you have to set those expectations. Like if you're going to have a change, really know that you want to make that change and let's take all the changes at once and be done because it's going to take us three weeks to get you that change <laughs> or we'll show it to you at a certain stage so that you know it's like this is sort of where we're going is that the right direction that you wanted because I'm not going to do all this work and have you oh no I meant to wag it the other way you know so it's like kind of knowing your timeline and when to in the very beginning, say on these dates, we're going to have a check in. And so you have to be available and be ready to make your notes then because you're, there's no going back. You know, that's a whole other world of producing. So. <laughs> yes, I always say that I learned to be a producer because I was a mom of four boys. You have to manage time, money, schedules expectations, and you have to be really good at saying the word no. <laughs> right. I'm not very good at that. I'm it's not, very uh, hard to say no to Christian Taylor, by the way. That's so. that's true for anybody, though. So it's not just you. <laughs> I think that's how we're all on this podcast. Right. 
<laughs> it's amazing that I didn't go to France. I just really couldn't get there. <laughs> and and it was only that. because you had health issues. Yeah. Otherwise, I think I could have gotten you on the plane. <laughs> no, sure. A trip to France, although I don't speak French, I'd have been like the most difficult producing experience because I wouldn't know how to talk to anybody. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sandy, we appreciate you being on the podcast two in a row. Thank you. And we definitely want to have you back. Um, learned quite a bit. Um, can people get oh. your books places? Yeah. So, well, the great jobs for film majors is no longer in print. It was really for high schools, but um, action, establishing your career in film and television production is on Amazon. You can get it for like two bucks. You can also go to the library. It should be in your local library. You can ask for it. There's a caveat. It's, it's, a, re it's a rather old book. It's like pre, it's like early internet. So a lot of the advice that I give is how to do things with like pen and paper. Um, and some of the film office contact information has changed. But the stories about what a grip does and, and how casting works and all of those things are completely relevant and fun. There's like fun behind the scenes stories from a lot of different crew people of what they had to do. Like a grip on Rudy holding a, a stand in a lightning storm wondering if he was going to die, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a fun read and you can find it at the library, so. Awesome, all right, well, thanks again. And uh, to our listening audience, thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.